we were talking about viewing everything through the filter of being sons of God. And we have another scripture, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Now, uh, we've done teaching along these lines, especially along the lines of being sons of God. Uh, we have the manifested sons of God that we did as a seminar that we did also. Uh, we have in the, in the bookstore. Uh, and we had a Dominion Life Saints movement, which we've taught uh, years ago or actually a couple of years ago now. And uh, it goes, it's mainly talking about the movement that God was trying to birth. And, and you know, we've talked about a lot of different things. We'll be seeing this here in just a moment. <clears throat> but the move God is trying to birth in the church, a lot of it has been birthed, but there's pieces that haven't yet come together and the church hasn't seen it yet. But at some point, the church is going to have to get the vision that God has for the body of Christ and for the church as a whole and start to put these things together and walk them out. The church was never meant to be just a little group off in the corner that you know, had a little sign of it that says, well, if you want to be spiritual, come over here and join us. That wasn't it. We were to be salt in this earth, right? We're to be light in this earth. And even the term, we'll look at this in a few minutes probably, uh, the term for the church, the ecclesia, is actually meant a, a council, as we would say, like a city council. And they were to have authority. They were to, to uh, bring literally the kingdom of God into that city and to establish those things and to uh, make sure that the things that were not of the kingdom of God were not being done in that city. So they were supposed to be, supposed to be salt uh, in that city. And so there is an authority and a dominion that's supposed to walk in, not just a uh, little kumbaya group that gets together and, you know, holds out till Jesus comes. Amen. It says to occupy till he comes. And occupy means to take ground and hold it. Okay? So, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And the cross, of course, was a very uh, humiliating death. Okay? Very, it was looked down upon. I mean, of all the ways to die, that was like the worst. Okay? Um, now, notice he says in the beginning, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And he talks about taking on the form of a servant. Humbling yourself. Regardless of where God has placed you, you still have to be a servant and serve. And the whole point is not about being, you know, the king. It's about, you know, you are kings and priests. But it's not about being the boss, I should say. It's about serving. And so if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, according to Jesus, you must serve. Amen? There's no other way. There's nothing else to do. And to serve usually means doing the things you don't want to do. It's that simple. All right? So, now, we're talking about dominion in every area. Dominion in every area. So, uh, I have a list here. Relationships, health, finances, politics, economy. You know, the, and, and the whole point is that you re make your own list. In what areas in your life should you be exercising dominion uh, in your own life? Uh, you know, in all these areas, uh, you should have dominion in the area of health. You should have dominion uh, over sickness and disease, not just in other people's lives, but in your own life, Amen. right? And then the same thing with finances. You, you should have dominion in the area of finance. That, that way that the, the world and the different things doesn't have the uh, ability to pull on you. But the only way to do it, I'm not talking about you having so much money piled up. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about you understanding what the kingdom of heaven is like so that you know that you have access to whatever you need when you need it. Right? Honestly, if you really want to get down to it, that is the true definition of prosperity. Right? Is knowing not what you have, but knowing what you have access to. And you have access to the kingdom of God. You got that? So, 
Now, and I left these for you to fill in, to fill those in and to write them. Now, look at the next one. Now, I know we're in session three and we're only getting to session two in the manual, but we're moving along at a decent pace. So, here it has a twofold purpose. The first part here is part, point A, and the, our first purpose, and, and it's a shame that the church doesn't have this yet. They still haven't seen it. But our, our first purpose as a believer, I don't care who you are, I don't care what, you know, I don't care if you're in a church, not in a church, in, you know, in a group, not in a group, none of that matters. You are here to teach and make disciples. Yeah. It's that simple. There's nothing else, right? You get that? If you're not making it, let me put it this way. You can be born again, spirit-filled, talk in tongues, uh, see healings take place wherever you go, and if you're not making the disciples, you're not in the middle of God's will. You understand that? God's will is that you teach and make disciples. This was his first command to us as believers. Right? It's a first command. So you can do all that other stuff. And if you're not making disciples, then you are not fulfilling God's will for your life. You got that? Because there is stuff you will never, never learn until you start to disciple someone else. And that's just the way it is. It's just like... A parent. There are things that you will never know until you have children. When you have, I mean, you, it is amazing. I've seen so many people that were not married, or even if they were, they didn't have kids, and they want to tell everybody how to raise kids. Yeah. And it's amazing. Well, if I ever have children, it'll be like this. It won't be like that. Yeah, okay, we'll wait and see. <laughs> I've never seen anybody stick to that, okay? Because what gets on their nerves about everybody else's kids, they'll think is the most adorable thing in their own child. Yeah. Right? So, we are commanded to go into all the world and make disciples. You get that? Not just make disciples, but to go into all the world. Amen. Right? Now, that doesn't mean you have to get on a plane and go to Africa tomorrow. It just means you've got to reach out. That's one of the good things about most countries now is there are so many, the, the whole world is in every country, right? Because when he says going to uh, the world and make disciples, going to all the world, and, and you make it, you go to all nations, that word is ethnos, and it means all different ethnic groups. And we have all ethnic groups in almost every continent, every nation now. So, you know, now if you have a burden to uh, maybe for some reason the uh, Indian people, uh, really just pulls on your heart and you want to see them accept Christ and come out of bondage uh, to false gods and that kind of stuff, uh, you don't have to get on a plane and go to India. You got them right here. Right? And it's amazing how many people want to go to India and think they're going to go over there and have this huge thing and yet they've never witnessed to an Indian here. Yeah. Right? Uh, that, that's foolish. Well, it's, it's, see, people have this romantic idea of what it means to be a missionary. And they think that they're going to put their foot on the ground and this anointing is going to come upon them and people are going to rush up to them and go, show us the way to be saved. And they're going to have this mass crusade. Right? And that's usually not the way it is. Right? And so the whole idea is that you start reaching people where they are. Don't go over there and make mistakes with their culture. Learn their culture here. Right? Learn what, what to do and what not to do. Learn, like if you're going to go to Thailand or something like that, guess what? Don't point your feet toward people when you sit down. Why? You point the bottoms of your feet toward people, you'll offend them. Why? Because that, that's an offense. Right? Uh, all kinds of other cultural things that you should learn before you go. Right? And that just so you don't make it harder for people to receive the gospel from you. Right? You can make it easier or harder. And so reach them here. Find out what reaches them here. When you find out what reaches them here, you'll know what to do when you get there. Right? And you can talk to them. You get somebody saved and healed here, they'll hear about it in India. Why? Because they'll call their family and it'll spread through the whole family before you ever get there. And so don't think you have to go first. Now, it's good to go. You should go. Uh, but you don't have to go in a sense of going across the world to reach people. Amen? You can jump on the internet and reach a whole bunch of people. You know? Put out a thing on the internet. Start a little website and say, you know, uh, Indian people need saving and you'll get responses. Right? I'm not going to tell you what kind. You'll get all kinds. But um, you know, you'll weed through and help the ones that need help. All right. So it is not an option for anyone that calls themselves a Christian. Right? Every Christian is to make disciples, to go into all the world, 
to do everything they can. Listen, you are not here to live your life for a job. It's just that simple. I've got dear friends that their whole life, well, when I, when, you know, I knew them for years, and their whole life was not a job. Well, it was a job, but not a particular job. In other words, they, they were, because I was never, uh, I, I knew what I was supposed to be doing. And I knew it wasn't the jobs that I had. And the jobs didn't mean anything to me. And because of that, as you probably heard before, if there was a camp meeting or something, they wouldn't let me off, I'd quit and go. And, you know, explain it to my wife later of when I quit. <laughs> okay, and that kind of thing. But I would, I would go and they said, Curry, you can't do that, man. You, you got to get stable. Because they, they saw me as unstable. No, I was unstable in a job thing, career, but I was stable in God. Amen. You understand? And they were saying, Curry, you got to do this, and you, gotta, you know, you, gotta, you have to do this way, and you have to build up credit so you can buy a house, and so you can get a car, and so you can do that, and you got to build this, and you got to do that. And I had no interest whatsoever in any of that. None. And now, 30 years later, they, they, they had, and I'm not trying to be critical or anything, but they had sowed their whole life into a job, into a, a career, into a field. And then whenever that job and that field was done with them, you're gone. And that's what they did. Here's your pink slip. Bye-bye. We don't need you anymore. You know? uh, and then they were gone. And then they got nothing. Right? And then they got to a place where they were struggling. And then they couldn't find another job in that field. And then they had to start looking at jobs, making a lot less money and doing these things. And, and you know, it's, it was kind of hard and easy not to go and say, see, see, you wasted your life. You know, uh, you know, I, 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 all the time that everybody thought I was wasting my life on jobs that didn't matter, I was studying. I was investing my life in the kingdom. And the kingdom has paid back. I mean, it's, you can't invest in a kingdom without getting paid back. You can't do it. It's, it's, a, it's a good retirement plan. It's a good uh, pension thing. It's, you know, it's good. Amen? Yeah. I'm telling you. What, it, it, do you realize jobs that are out there today? There are jobs out there today that weren't around 10 years ago. And there are jobs that were around 10 years ago that aren't out there today. Mm -hmm. right? You realize now even a college degree doesn't guarantee you anything except a big debt. Mm -hmm. Do you realize that? It doesn't promise you anything, right? And, and everybody said, well, you got to get this degree so you can do this job. There's no proof that a job's going to be there. There's no guarantee. You have no guarantee in this world. When the, when, when the world is done with, when the world sees that you're at a place that if it knocks you out of the running, so to speak, that you'll never be able to get another good thing like that, that's, that's how the enemy works. He baits you along, tries to tell you, oh, it'll be this way, it'll be this way. And when he gets you to a place where you're too old to actually move into another field, then he'll knock you out of that field. And then you have nothing. Why? Because the devil doesn't care a thing in the world about you. The world, this world system, they don't care a thing in the world about you. At best, you're a number. At best. Yes. Right? But the kingdom of God, you sow your life into the kingdom. You're saying, Curry, you tell me I should quit my job and go preach? I'm not saying quit your job. I'm saying you ought to go preach. Right? And if you get to where you're preaching so much that it interferes with your, with your job, then quit your job. Right? But go preach. You are caught. If you say you're a Christian, you've got to preach. There's no option. See, that's what I don't get. I, I've never understood people who think that they can make the rules. God is God. He makes the rules. He's, you know, it'd be like somebody coming to work for me here and saying, I want to come to work for you, but uh, uh, here's, here's my job description that I will do. And I would look at him and say, well, does it sound like you need to go over yonder where somebody else needs you because I don't need any of those things. Right? Why? Because here I decide what we need. Well, in the kingdom, God decides the job description. And you don't get to join and then make your own job description? Mm -hmm. what, what company would do that? Nobody does that. You have to line up with a job description. You know, it's kind of like saying, you know, at, most of you know I drive a Yukon, and you know, nothing, there's nothing great about it or anything else. It's just, it was the vehicle that God provided at the time. It's great, it works for me. So it, I'm not you know, pro this or that or anything else. I don't care. If it gets me there, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, right? 
But it's amazing that if I, if I, I could call that Yukon a Cadillac all day long. Right? Guess what? It's still not a Cadillac. Right? It's the same thing with any other thing. What you call it doesn't matter. You could say you're a Christian all day long, but if you're not doing what it says, then make you a Christian. Amen? Does that make sense? It's real simple. We, we, we want the benefits, but we don't want the responsibility. You know? Well, you know the benefits of being a parent? You know, do you know what the benefits of being a parent are? Grandchildren. Amen. Right? Yes. That's the benefits of being a parent. Amen? It's the grandchildren. Okay? And, and yet people want the benefits but they don't want the responsibility of kids. Well, you don't get the benefit of grandchildren if you don't go through the responsibility of children. See, it's just that simple. And so we have to realize God made the rules. Just line up with them. It's not hard. The rules are for our benefit. They actually keep it. That's why he says, you know, well, that's too narrow. It's not too narrow. That's where life is, right? Out there is death. The way that leads to life is narrow. That's, you know, that's narrow. But what I'm saying is that it's not narrow or hard. It's narrow meaning this is safety. This is life. This is good. You get out there, it's bad. It'll kill you. So stay within the confines of the Word of God and just walk on the narrow road. It's not that hard. Yes. It's really good. Matter of fact, it's a blessing. Amen. Amen? So Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came, spoke unto them, saying, All power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach, disciple, make students of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them, and notice here's what you're going to teach them, to observe, that means to know and to do, all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Amen doesn't mean the end. It means so be it. Right? So the whole idea is that we are to go into all the world and make disciples. Every Christian should have a disciple, at least one. You know, more the better. Then, of course, Mark chapter 16, verse 15, He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Now notice, he tells them again, this is a job description. He says, you want to know what it is? If you believe, here's what you're going to do. If you want to call yourself a believer, how do you know you're a believer? You do these things. Right? That's one, these are all job descriptions. It's real simple. It's not a, a, a choice. It's not a matter of, well, well, we don't believe this and we don't believe that and that's speaking in tongues, we don't believe in that. Well then, what kind of Christian do you think you are? Because you're not a Bible Christian. Well, we don't believe in laying hands on the sick. Well, then call yourself something else. Cause why? Because if you're a Christian, here's what you're going to do. If you're a believer, right? This is real, real simple. It's, it's when people start getting theological that it gets all confusing. Right? Now, so point B. Say, point A, remember you had to go teach. Point B is you have to grow up. So it's two, two words about the Christian life. Go and grow. Isn't that simple? Real easy to remember. Go and grow. All right? We are destined to grow up into the image and likeness and measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's Ephesians chapter 4 here. You'll see it. We are destined to walk in the perfection that is in Christ. Now, I'm not going to read all this to you, but it's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 through 18. But if you go down to verse 13, it says... Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Unto a perfect man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. <clears throat> and notice, he says, so that, verse 14, that henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Notice this, verse 16. From whom 
the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. According to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh the increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, this is, of course, this is King James, so you have to kind of decipher it. But all he's saying is this. We are to grow up, and many Christians, they look at verses you know, 8 through 11 or 15, and they see that, but they don't realize point 16. In almost every church, and we have it here too, it's, it's every church, uh, there are people that you ask them if they're members of the church, they say, I'm a member of this church. This is my church, this is my home church, this is my church. Okay? And yet, they're not connected, not plugged in, not fellowshipping, other than when they're here. They never see anybody here except when they're here. Never see them the rest of the week. Don't see them anywhere but in this building. Don't fellowship with them. Don't, don't know other people here. And yet, here he says, notice, from, because most of them think that they're in this thing for themselves. And we have people, obviously, too, come from all over the world here, and most of them come here for themselves. They come here to get what they can get, and their whole plan is, at some point, I'm going to leave and go do something else. And that's, that's fine. That's their prerogative. But the problem is, when you have that plan from the beginning, that, by definition, means you never actually connect. Why? Because you're never really here. You're always just waiting to leave. So you're never plugged in. You're, no matter what you do you know, around, you're never apart. You're here, you function, but you're never apart. See, that's, um, well, in the military we had that, and, and you have it on teams at times, to where they're never a part of the team. All they want to do is shine. They want to make promotion, and they want to do what they can do until they can get somewhere else. And the bad part about that is when they do that, because that's the, what they're sowing, when they get somewhere else, that's what they're going to reap. That's the kind of people they're going to reap. See, not people that actually plug in and, and work toward fulfilling a vision, but people that are only interested in themselves getting somewhere. Rather than getting together and starting to realize we can do something and instead, it's always a matter of what can I get so I can go, right? Now, and we're going to talk about that, as a matter of fact, again today. We're going to get all that done. So I keep saying we're going to talk about that. So you know, toward the end of the day, we're going to talk about a whole lot, right? So no, he says here, notice this, from whom the whole body fitly joined together. So God brings the body together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. See, that's the point right there is that People come to church, and when they come to get, there are other people there that need what, they, what those people have, but because everybody comes to get, nobody comes to give. And I'm not, uh, not talking about money and that kind of stuff. I'm saying that they're not there to actually get involved in other people's lives, that they're only there to hear and learn, and they don't think in terms of, okay, you know, I've noticed that person, they look down today. I'm going to go talk to them. Uh, hey, well, you know, what, are you, what are you doing after church? Do you want to get together? Let's go, let's go grab a bite to eat. Well, you don't have to walk up and go, what's wrong with you? No, everything's fine. Blessed and highly favored. You know, they'll put on their Christian face, mm -hmm. hide behind the mask, and say the right words. But instead you say, uh, hey, how about after, after church? Let's, uh, let's go grab a bite to eat together. Well, I don't know. Well, why not? come on. We, we never get to talk. And then you go talk with them. You sit and you find out what's going on. Why? Because the body has to be fitly joined together. You're not joined together if you don't know what's going on. You know? You're not joined together if you're not involved in people's lives. Let me tell you, Christianity, we, we said this all the time, especially with life teams. We do life teams because a life worth living is a life too big to live alone. It's too big to do alone. You do it as a group. You do it as a team. Why? Because you're going to need help. Two walk, walk together together. You know, if one falls, the other one lifts them up. But when you walk alone, there's nobody there to lift you up. And sometimes you need somebody other than a spouse. You need somebody else that you can talk to. You know, uh, different things going on. You need, that God made us as Christians to need Him and to need one another. He made us that way. 
right? Now, the key is to find Christians that can actually work together to come together that want to join together, right? That's the hardest part, especially today. I'm seeing it more and more. It was, it was pretty big when I was growing up uh, in the church, but at the same time, it's even more so now to where there are so many people now that are just independent by themselves, individuals, and they don't want to walk as a team, don't want to walk as a group, don't want to, to fellowship together, you know, for whatever reason. Sometimes they've been hurt before or whatever it is, you know. There's all kinds of reasons. Everybody's got reasons. Bottom line is God said this. You got it? So, and he says here, according, yeah, and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. You see that? Unto the edifying of itself in love, to the building up of itself. Every part comes together. Now, but now notice, it's not just to come together just to talk. It is to come together to edify itself in love. Amen? To build itself up, to encourage, to, to uh, edify, as we would say. So it's not just a matter of just coming together just to learn. We've got to get that you know, out of our head because information alone will not help you. Right? Information is good, but you have to be able to walk it out. You have to live it out of your life. And believe it or not, if you're going to live this stuff out through your life, you're going to, the only way to live out the Christian life is to touch other lives. Christianity is not like Buddhism. Right? It's not like Zen. Uh, where the whole point is you perfecting yourself and you isolating yourself to where you meditate and you become this perfect human being. Because honestly, I'll be, you know, to be very honest with you, it's pretty easy to be perfect as long as you don't have to deal with anybody else. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. But real perfection comes as you get the rough edges kind of knocked off of you and sometimes you knock some of the rough edges off of others and you work together. Right? Christianity cannot be lived alone. You understand that? It's just real simple. Now, he goes on. Look at verse 17. This I say, therefore, because of what he just said, and testify in the Lord that you henceforth, from now on, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. In other words, their mind is totally on them. It's totally about them. And he says, Don't, that's not you anymore. You're not going to be thinking about yourself. Why? Because you're going to be part of the body that is fitly joined together and you're going to be thinking, what can I do to help them? Now I'll give you a couple others. Well, I'll go ahead and read the rest of this. In verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Now, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 21, uh, the guy came to Jesus and he said, you know, what do I have to do to be perfect? And Jesus said, if you would be perfect, right? If you would be perfect. And notice this is before his crucifixion. And the word perfect there is the Greek word teleos. And it means to be mature. It means to be, we could say complete, but it's not just complete. But it literally means to be mature and a full age. So whenever he said, if you would be perfect, what he was telling this guy was, if you want to be mature, if you want to be a full age, if you want to be wise, if you want to work the way you're supposed to, if you want this to be like it's supposed to be, here's what you do. Right? And what did he tell him to do? Go sell all that he had. Go to all this. And, but now notice, it wasn't the selling of all that. And he said, and he, he told him, not just sell it, but he said, lay up treasure in heaven. In other words, focus on the kingdom of God. If you focus on that, then whenever nothing else has its hold on you and you focus on the kingdom of God and you seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, as he's already said in Matthew 6, he said, when you do that, you'll be perfect. You'll be mature, right? A full age. Now, in Matthew 5, 48, he even tells us, he says, Be ye perfect, therefore, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, see, he tells us to be perfect as God is perfect. People say, well, that's just, that doesn't make sense. That's impossible. Okay, well, let's, again, 
where he says, uh, be perfect as your father is perfect. Both words are the same word that was used in Matthew 19, where he said, if you would be perfect. Both of them are the same. It's the Greek word teleos. So he says, be mature as your heavenly father is mature. Right? Be a full age. In other words, be, don't be immature. Don't be unwise. Don't be foolish. Be wise. Be perfect as your heavenly father, or as your father which is in heaven, is perfect. You can be perfect in that sense. doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. It means that you are mature, that you are stable, that you're not going from one doctrine to the next, that you're not, you know, <clears throat> well, just, just as uh, they said in, in the movie Peter and Paul, like a reed blown in the wind. That's not the way we're to be. We are to be solid, stable, moving forward, right? Now, it means um, also... Uh, it, it, to be perfect, the word teleos means to be mature, a full age, but can also be mean to be complete. But it's not the same word that is used in uh, Colossians 2.10 or Colossians 4.12 where he says uh, to be complete in all the will of God, to be complete in Christ. Okay, uh, There, the word complete means to be plero. It, the Greek word is plero. And it means literally, get this, to be complete in Christ. Um, when he, when he tells us, it says, and you are complete in him, okay? It's, it's not the word for mature because you're, com you're born again complete, right? But you're not born again mature. You have to grow up. But to be born, when it says to be complete, he literally, it literally means this. It's, it's, it doesn't even sound like a definition. It sounds like slang almost. But he says to, to be complete means to be crammed full. Think about that. You were born again crammed full. To get that. See? In other words, you got everything you need. Everything is in you. You were born again complete. You were crammed full of God when you got born again. Old things are passed away, all things have become new, and all things are of God. That's who's in you. And you are crammed full. You don't, not only do you not need anything else, you couldn't get anything else in you because you're crammed full. You got that? And now you say that, but if I'm crammed full, what's the next step? Now it's time to grow up and learn how to use what you're crammed full of. Right? Do you get that? That's what he means when he tells us to be complete in him. Now, in um, <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, it says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach meaning we preach Christ, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. You hear that? Now notice, get this. I, I, it, when you start looking into the actual words used in the Greek language, phenomenal. Because I've already told you the word perfect, teleos, means to be mature, and then the other word, uh, where well, the word for complete is plero, means to be crammed full. And here he says, and now get this, when I first read this, I'm thinking, okay, how, how does that fit? Because he says, whom we preach, verse 28, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And the word perfect there is the same word, teleos. It means to be mature, that we may present every man mature in Christ Jesus. Well, how, how can we make sure that we present every man mature? Easy. Warning, warning every man, teaching every man. So what are we doing? We're teaching and we're warning. Yes, do this, don't do that. Why? Because if you do this and you don't do that, you will mature. You will grow up. But if I, if I don't tell you, don't do that then you won't change and you'll stay baby and you won't grow up. So he said, our job is to teach, is to warn, is to, to rebuke, correct, whatever you've got to do. But in all of that, so that we can present every man mature in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus is coming after a mature church. He's not coming after a baby church. He's coming, as we just read in Ephesians, that we're all going to grow up into him, into the stature of the fullness of the measure of Christ. And we have to realize that as we grow up into him, that's, that is what Romans 8 is talking about, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. 
He's waiting for us to grow up. And we do that by teaching, warning, admonishing, uh, rebuking if necessary, whatever it takes. But it, it, it's so that people can grow up. It's not just to be mean or to be a wet blanket on somebody's party. Right? It is to grow people up. Amen? So, now, let's go to the next one. Point C. Point C is to go out. Okay? So, you got to grow, but you also got to go out, as we said before. And I emphasize this in the manual here. It says, nowhere, nowhere, capital letters, exclamation. Got it? Nowhere in the New Testament are you given the choice of what you will or will not do for God. You got that? Nowhere are you given a choice. You are given a choice to be a Christian or not be a Christian. But once you decide to be a Christian, you're not given a choice as to what you will do or what you will not do. We, we never take into account the words used in the Bible. When he says words like Paul, uh, Paul said it, Peter said it, uh, most of them said it, uh, James said it. What do they all say? They all start the same way. Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. Right? The word is servant, it means slave. Many times the, the English word there is servant a lot of times. Paul said he was a slave of Jesus Christ. Peter said a slave of Jesus Christ by the will of God. James said a servant, a slave of Jesus Christ. Right? Now the word used, doulos, for Paul especially, means a slave who has decided to become a slave. Right? In other words, they were a slave and then they became a family slave in the sense that they were given the opportunity to have their freedom and they chose not to take their freedom but to become a perpetual slave so that they could be attached to that uh, master. And when that happened, they would take a, a, an, a, an awl and they would drill a hole in the ear and then they would put a thing there to, for that family that represented that family. And the thing is, is that when that slave did that, that family essentially adopted that slave as an adopted son, even though he was a slave. And he was given all the benefits of a member of the family. Now think about that. But he was a slave forever. You hear that? And see, we don't like that. Well, I'll be a slave to nobody. Well, then you can't be a Christian. Because well, Christians are slaves. Think of that. Slaves to Jesus Christ. And in him, you find true freedom. Amen. Right? And so you won't have to be in bondage to sin, in bondage to habits, in bondage to addictions, in bondage to anything because you are in bondage to Jesus. You get that? Now, this doesn't go over good, but it's facts whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, you had a choice of whether to be a Christian or not. But the choice was whether to be a slave or not. Okay? So... But once you become a Christian, now you have no choice in what you will or will not do. The, the problem comes in in you, whether you admit as to whether you actually hear the voice of God or not. Okay? Because God speaks, and a lot of people, they, they try to excuse it and try to say, oh, well, that's just me. And then, what if it's you? Why are you thinking that? Okay? If it was you, you'd go do it. But instead you think it, and then you decide, no, I don't want to do that. Well, it's usually because it's God telling you to do it and you don't want to do it because it doesn't fit in with your plans. Right? And we have to realize the only plan that matters is God's. That's the only one that matters. All this other stuff, all these other plans, the right? Bible says man makes his plans, God directs his steps. Yeah. It's real simple. We said that the other day. Uh, one of you guys, who was it? Was it? At the, at the, at the day when we were talking, said if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Remember that? Yeah, that's, that's true. That's good. So, see, I told you I'd use that at some point. So, you know, so. Now, we are His. We do whatever we are commanded. We don't make the rules. We follow the rules. There are 1,070 commands in the New Testament. Right? Now, luckily, you don't have to memorize all of them. All you have to know is this. Love God. Love your neighbor. Do to others as you would have done to you, and you won't violate one of them. Isn't that easy? So, but if you go, by, go back and look at them, there are commands all the way through. When you join the military, you don't raise your hand and give an oath and then go back home and sit on your couch and wait to receive your government pension. <coughs> but that's what most Christians do. But that's not who we are. Okay? You go and get taught how to be a good soldier, and then you go and be a good soldier. 
His commands are not grievous to the soul of one committed to Him. If you're committed to Him, what He asks you to do is not hard. Why? Because all you're doing is waiting for the command. So, He didn't say you had to go and stay. He just said you had to go. If you need to, you can go and come back. But you have to make a difference. Instead of going on vacation, go on a mission. It's amazing how many people live for their vacation. I'm just going to go take a vacation, get away from everything. No, go take a mission. Right? Instead of going somewhere and spending all your money on yourself, go somewhere and spend yourself on someone else. Invest in the lives of others. This is what real Christianity is about. Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now think about that. Jesus said that, so it's a fact. Is it not? Isn't it a fact? So wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Right? And honestly, if you follow that through, then many of your treasure is in Hollywood. Because that's where you spend your money on movies and everything else. Or you spend your time on something else. Or you spend, you spend your, your, your money on, you know, some of your... Some of your treasures in uh, Golden, Colorado. That's the home of Coors, right? Or Schlitz or Budweiser, which is really Bud Stupider, but anyway, they call it Budweiser. Anyway, so <clears throat> I've never seen Bud make anybody wiser. Amen? I've just seen him get stupid. So, Matthew chapter 6. And if you, know, if you want to know how come I know where Coors is, Okay, in Golden, Colorado, it's because I lived about 15 minutes from it when we lived in Denver. I had to drive past it on the way to the mountains. You go out to the mountains where you want to go out there and just walk around and look at all the amazing handiwork of God. And you got to pass by the Coors factory and all the stuff that's out there. And I always want to go out there and just plant little white crosses all up and down their driveway from all the people they killed uh, because they've killed more people than, you know, influenza or any other of those things, right? And so... And the amazing thing is the people that own the places generally don't do it themselves. They don't drink it. Why? Because they know what it causes. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, like the major drug dealers don't do drugs. Mm-hmm. Why? Because you couldn't do it too long. You'd eat into your own profits. Because right? your habit would get stronger. But that's what we, we, people don't realize where these things go and where, how much people spend their money on it. You know? I, I saw a, a homeless guy the other day sitting under a bridge had his shopping cart with all of his stuff in it and kicked back and had a six-pack of beer. But he had been out standing on the corner asking for money, went and got beer, was sitting there drinking beer uh, afterwards. Didn't have a house, but he's got beer. You see, he's not been any type of uh, aspect. He's not contributing to society. And we are here to contribute to the betterment of society. Amen? Amen? Yeah. So... Matthew 6, 19, we just read part of this. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and stock markets fall and government raids your pensions and where thieves break through and steal. All right, see, I already mentioned all of them. Anyway, okay. <clears throat> Verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. But if your eye be evil, your whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now get this. No man can do that. You get that? Jesus said it. So don't think you're so smart that you'll be the first to be able to serve two masters. Don't think, well, you know, I can figure this out. I can, I can balance this. No, there's no balance. It's, it's, there's no balance to it. You serve one or the other. It's that simple. And you get to decide which one. God gave us a will whereby we can decide who we serve and what we do. Right? I'm going to be teaching on the will here before too long. And we're going to look at some aspects of it. God has a will. You have a will. He gave us a free will which does not mean you get to do anything you want. Amen. Right? He gives you a free will, meaning that you get to choose which path you take, but there will be a consequence for either path. All right? Now, finally, yeah, I'm going to... Actually, you know what? We're going to go ahead and stop here. We'll come back 
after lunch and talk about session three, which we're talking about the last great revival. So it ought to be interesting. Amen? So, y'all get anything out of this so far? Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to delve into it and be talking about how to exercise the dominion, uh, what it means. We're going to go into some details on it, but we're going to see God has more in store than for us to live little isolated lives whereby we have our needs met. That is not God's plan. You got it? His plan is that we be a part of his end time army, his end time body that actually produces Jesus Christ in the lives of people and exercises the dominion of God in every area of their life. Amen? All right, y'all go to break. We will be back at 2 o'clock. Be back here at 2 o'clock.